turn my phone off. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I am live. Of course, it's uh, Mitch Taco Bell, and this is Tall Tales with Taco on Tuesday. As I promoted on Facebook, I want you guys to give a big round of applause for my dear friend, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Strobel, who you see on the other screen right there. Mike is the Marine who took, um, well, he wrote Taking Chance, but it started out as, a, as an email. And uh, Mike has, over the years, uh, given a lot of his time, dedicated a lot of his time traveling around giving speeches about it. But he would also come talk to our kids at the Summer Leadership Character Development Program in Quantico. And it, it was the end of a community service project where we had them cleaning gravestones at Quantico National Cemetery. And at the end of the day, we would show them that movie. Well, after asking a few questions, I would just stop and I'd say, why don't we ask the actual officer uh, and invite him down? And Mike would walk down and answer questions for about a good hour, hour and a half. Mike, welcome aboard. And I can't uh, thank you enough for joining us tonight. How are you doing? Good. Thanks. It's good to be here. Hey, good to be here in my, in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least the Internet's working and uh, you're six yeah. feet above ground. Nobody's shooting at you, right? Yeah, good. Right. All's good. Well, hey, give us a little background on how Taking Chance started. For those who have never seen the movie or read the email, which, by the way, went viral and was on my, my government laptop I had to turn in years ago, and I regret that uh, that was one of them I, I didn't save, and it, it ticks me off, but that thing went viral before viral was even a term. Yeah, so... Um... I, I'm not sure exactly where to start, so I'll, I'll kind of maybe start midway. I was um, escorting Chance's remains from Dover Air Force Base in Delaware out to uh, his family in Du Bois, Wyoming. Ooh. And I, they, they told us when we started that we would ha have to do an after action report uh, at the end of it, which is kind of standard for military things like this. So that sort of made me uh, maybe more aware of uh, or or more observant of things that were going on, uh, knowing that I would I would be required to submit an after action report. And and what I saw and and by the way, the, the story is certainly not your typical after action report. That's kind of a you know mundane uh, reminders to things like bring a cell phone charger or stuff like that. Um, Right. What, what what I what I started to see is as soon as um, as er, as soon as I was in uh, Dover, and then all the way across the country was were just a number of gestures by uh, by ordinary Americans all across the country who were so profoundly moved by uh, Chance's sacrifice and their gratitude and their sorrow. And and the, what I the reason I started writing in, in my little journal, my notebook, was because I wanted to remember it for myself, and be, just be, because it was so profound. And then right. when I when I uh, finally got back to Virginia, it, it turned out to be about a week long trip due to some uh, some various delays. Um, I I had about twenty pages written in my in my notebook and. Um, I typed them up just to make them a, a more legible and, and uh, to show my wife really was was my target audience. And then I figured since I had it in a an electronic format, I might as well send it to a few people. So I sent it to about eight, eight or nine um, co-workers or family members. And then, uh, as everybody knows, you know, they uh, how quickly emails can spread. Oh, they yeah. started sending it around and eventually it was very widely circulated. and. I learned later that uh, there was a, uh, a man uh, in California whose uh, son was also killed in Iraq, uh, a Marine, and mm -hmm. somebody had seen my story and they gave it to him. And he read it and it just so happens that he was friends with a um, Hollywood movie producer and he shared it with, with that guy. Uh, Brad Cravoy is the name of the producer and, and wow. he... He then uh, took it to HBO and, and it went from there. So kind of a serendipitous, uh, uh, you know, I never intended for, I, I really never intended for wide publication of, of even the original story, much less a movie. And I, I, I truly believe if I had set out to write a movie, it, it would have not worked. Um, 
Right. But my, my goal was just to remember what I was seeing. And uh, so that's you don't realize how, how powerful mind. your words are, you know, when put to paper. Those are some those were some powerful emotional things that were translated in a very short amount of space. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks. I mean, I, it I, 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 I would like to take credit for it, but I have to tell you, it was the people I saw, the, the interactions I had uh all along all across the country were just so profound and moving uh that it it's in some ways kind of wrote itself i just i just was the observer uh the, the profound nature of what happened was was really my interaction with other people and i would even say it, it was uh, as strange as this might sound it was their interaction with chance right uh, who uh, like myself they had never seen or met did um, so you help write the screenplay, so you have the credit for that. Did did that ever give you an idea that maybe I could uh, express some more stories about the past and and things that you experienced? I mean, I know my buddy Parker Perkins was with you on that float. You know, he he goes, man, there are some great stories. We just need to sit down and write them. You know, did that ever yeah. get you to put pen to paper on stuff? Um, uh, I well, it's interesting. I've kept a journal um, three times in my life, uh, kind of uh, other than some sporadic, you know, one-off events uh, or, or assignments that I had to do. But voluntarily, I, I kept a journal three times. One was on a deployment uh, on ship. Uh, nothing dramatic. I, it was just an interesting uh, thing to be doing. Uh, you know, I, I we were uh, on a Western Pacific uh, deployment and visited, uh, I don't even remember how many countries. And, you know, for a kid from Western Colorado, it was it was something I wanted to remember. The other was right. uh, Desert Storm. I, I kept a journal during that because um, I, I thought it might be kind of a profound event in my life. Um, and, then, and then the third was uh, my experience with Chance. Uh, wow. I haven't really thought about uh, screenplay or uh, any other kind of story. Um, but I, I, you know, I would tell people, um, I, I, I have written, like, I, I did a monthly op-ed for a local newspaper, that sort of thing, but, but nothing mm -hmm. of a, that kind of length. But I, I would tell people, I, I think everybody has an interesting story to tell. And if, if that's something they want to do, I, I really would encourage them to, to, you know, go for it. You, you'd be surprised what interests other people. I'm kind of, uh, lately, I'm I'm into reading biographies, and some of them are. It's just hearing stories of other people's uh, day to day lives can be very interesting. Right. Well, Paula, uh, quick had a question. What surprised you most about the process? Uh, that whole whole process from A to Z. Was there anything that kind of surprised you? Took you back? Like I didn't expect that. Let me clarify. Does he mean the process of making making the movie, or the process of of well? Uh, the actually, names? let's go from from Andrews or from Dover. Yeah. Um, as well, the movie. First of all, I I want to ask. I, I think the movie did a great job sticking with the script because you had a hand in it. Um, I understand Hollywood has a way of kind of combining things and shortening things. Yeah. Were, was there anything about the movie or the editing that you thought we could have done differently? Because I, I tell you, for the most part, we all thought it was a great job. Yeah, I, I think HBO and, and Ross Katz was the director, uh, Kevin Bacon. They did a fantastic job. And, and I'll tell you, I spent four days on the set and everybody involved uh, from Kevin Bacon and, the, and Ross and and all the cast and crew, they, and I, I learned this by both by watching and talking to various people who work in the business that they approach this differently than a lot of their, a lot of movies or TV shows they made in the past. Everybody was very committed to this. Um, so that was an interesting part of the process. Um, I, I, I mean, we can, we can talk about the making of the movie. I think it sounds like the question is kind of on the process of escorting the remains. Right. Yeah. Not the movie. Uh, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that. And, and I, I, I do have to caveat it. It's been, it's been a number of years now. Um, but 
here's some thoughts that come come quickly to mind about the process. One one is that a a casket is is very large, and the logistics of moving a casket across the country um, is it's really no small feat, especially when um, when you are so invested and concerned about getting it there safely and with honor and respect. Um, yeah. So that, that part of the process kind of, uh, I, I remember the first time I, I saw that it wasn't even, I should clarify that the casket in a shipping container, which just adds more volume to the whole, um, you know, to the, to everything. And, and it, it was, it, it took me aback a little bit of how large it was. Um, yeah. And I, I guess that's just, that might be a trivial detail, but it's something that, that came to mind quickly. An, another thing though, about the process that I, that I experienced and, and really surprised me and that I've since learned is, is not all that uncommon among other uh, service members that have been an escort of remains is, is how I began, Almost every minute of our travels, I felt like I was forming an emotional connection to chance. Right. And and uh, you have to think about th this is somebody I had never met. Um, yet uh, I, I I I think this might resonate especially with Marines, but with all service members. You know, even though I never met him, just by virtue of him being a Marine, there were things I knew about him. Oh, yeah. And and things I probably knew about him that, you know, his own family didn't know. Um, and it, there's that, that connection uh, that, that Marines have and I think all service members have. But I, I didn't expect, uh, as part of the process of, of traveling across the country, I didn't expect to become so emotionally um, attached to somebody I'd never met. So when you, uh, let's walk through so you went from andrews uh bwi no it, well dover um the so we drove from dover to philadelphia which at, mm -hmm. at that time was was um if if remains were flying anywhere they started at philadelphia gotcha and and now let me before we before i re recount every stop of my trip i would point out that uh since my uh mission with chance the Department of Defense has changed the process in a few ways, one of which is now remains fly on a dedicated aircraft, kind of a, an executive, uh, you might know more than I do, but like a Learjet style, where it's just the remains and the escort. Um, that's, oh, really? Because um, we yeah. still, yeah, American, we still, we have remains come through and oh, we have mm -hmm. a, we have an honor team at DFW. Uh, at, okay. They go out there and they the honor guard and they they pull the remains off and uh, it's a yeah. really top notch job that our guys do. Uh, Glenn okay. Williams and, and all his folks yeah, over there. So so for military they they do that. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I guess I should be careful. My my information might be dated by quite a few years. There there was a time and and maybe it wasn't. Maybe they either stopped doing it or it was only for certain occasions, uh, depending on the destination, perhaps. But for a while, they were flying on a dedicated uh, aircraft. But be, be that as it may, uh, I flew on commercial flights. Um, so we started in Philadelphia. And then uh, from there, we flew to Minneapolis. And one thing that was a little unusual with my mission, uh, I think mainly because we got a late start out of Dover on the day we left, is I had an overnight stay in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. and, and then we flew to uh, Billings, Montana, and mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I was met there by a uh, by the funeral home, uh, and we drove about five hours from there to Riverton, Wyoming, where the funeral home was. And then actually, the funeral was in uh, Dubois, which is yet another ninety miles away. So, oh wow, it, it, it was a lot of uh, mixture of you know flights and and some long drives. Yeah, because you're from Grand Junction, right? Right. Goes yeah, and, and then he enlisted in that town next to Grand Junction. Right. Yeah, Clifton, Colorado is. Uh, so, so he was a senior in high school when he enlisted. He was a senior in Clifton, Colorado, 
and because that's where he joined, that's uh, the the Defense Department press release that announced his death um, lifted, listed Clifton, Colorado, as the as his home. So right. I I just assumed, which I, I you know shouldn't have assumed, and it, and ultimately it didn't matter. But I assumed that's where he'd be going, and I I thought it made sense that, that because I knew the area, hometown. Um, yeah, and I, I I would be the best person to be the escort. And, it, and now it turned out though, his his family had moved back to Wyoming uh, in between the time he joined the Marine Corps and and when he was killed. And uh, now you're still still up with uh, his father and and the family. Yeah, um, yeah, his father John, his mom Gretchen, and and her husband uh, Jeff. Uh, we, uh, John couldn't make it, but I was, I was with Gretchen and Jeff as recently. Well, now it's been about a, it's been a year and almost exactly a year as I think about it. Uh, we were, we were in Houston together last October for the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation. They endowed a scholarship in Chance's name. And, oh, that's awesome. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty neat. And they, they had us there in Houston for that inaugural, uh, uh, event when they, they, uh, uh, raise money for multiple scholarships, including the new Chance Phelps scholarship. You know, I've been to Grand Junction. Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember driving an RV through there, and it said, "Last chance for gas. <laughs> Stop now." You know. Yeah, and, and they, they weren't kidding. It was beautiful. I mean, that was a beautiful drive, but yeah, yeah, you you definitely wanted to stop for gas. So I know, I know the windshield time that you probably had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was a lot right. out well, there. Well, and, and you know, uh, like I said, we uh, we drove five hours uh, from um, from Billings to Riverton, Wyoming, and that's right. a lot of time to reflect. And and this was, um, you know, the the rental car I had didn't have satellite radio, and oh. you get in the middle of uh, you know northern Wyoming, and uh, radio is kind of spotty, and and it was a lot of time to reflect. And I think. Um, that kind of helped contribute to the story really that is, is all the time I had to, to just quietly reflect on what was happening. Right. Well, let's go into the movie now. The process, did Bacon get to hang out with you for a couple of days before the movie even started or how did he attack playing you? Yeah, he did. Um, first of all, I'll say I, I had no hand at all in choosing uh, anybody on the cast, but I, I, they couldn't have done a better job, I think. Kevin Bacon, yeah. uh, he he took this very seriously, and uh, he interestingly he is also a father, and uh, his son at the time um, was roughly Chance's age uh, when Chance oh, wow. was killed. So I I don't know. You'd have to ask him, but I think that that sort of contributed to the emotional weight that he brought to the role. Um, they we did uh, we met before they started filming. Uh, HBO brought him down and and the director Ross. I, I had met Ross prior, but they came. Ross and Kevin came down together to uh, to Quantico, and we uh, we went to the Marine Corps Museum. I wanted to show him around and kind of give him a feel for the Marine Corps. And then uh, he had dinner with us at our house and and kind of got to know me a little bit. And then we spent some time uh, the next day. Uh, Interestingly, it was the week it, I, I still remember this because I started my new job post post active duty on a on a Monday, and Kevin right. Bacon came to visit that Wednesday. And I remember having to tell my brand new boss, who I hardly knew, I said, <laughs> "I I know I've only been here two days, but I need I need to take leave tomorrow because Kevin Bacon's coming to see me." <laughs> so, <laughs> so six degrees of separation yeah, from right. Kevin now. So I, I, I uh, asked Kevin Bacon if he'd be interested in touring the Pentagon where my new job was so I could prove to my boss that I actually, you know, was doing what I said I would be doing. You're a smart man. A little <laughs> autograph action. Kevin, yeah. everyone's happy. Yeah. And let me let me say something about about him. Um, I realize people who have seen the movie and who know me, they say that he really nailed it. And uh, in in kind of capturing my mannerisms and a, a lot of the, the way I move and, and talk. And yeah. I realized after the movie came out and people were telling me this, that in the, in the brief time we spent together before He's they started studying. shooting, he was studying me. He really was. And, yeah. and it, it's kind of a, 
testimony to the quality of actor and person he is that, that that's kind of how he approached this. He, he even, uh, I remember, interestingly, he asked me for my um, iTunes playlist uh, back then to kind of, uh, I, I think, to help get to know the kind of person I am. So, I, you know, I had to delete right. a few songs and then I could share it with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Somebody had asked, did you teach him how to salute? But, I mean, he played a Marine and a few good men. He played a Marine in another movie, too. What? Yeah, uh, he was right. Uh, great, great uh, uh, trivia, uh, movie trivia there. Mer Kevin Kevin Bacon's played a Marine three times. Um, and the third one is um, uh, Frost Nixon. Now, he, he was he was a I, I've only seen that once when it first came out. But if I remember right, he was the military aide to the president, I think. Yeah, that movie. that's right. Yeah. So he's, got, he's had a little bit of experience, exposure to putting on some alphas and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, taking, knowing you and, and seeing him in that it, it is, he really was, he studied you well. That was spot on. Did yeah, you he, take him to the Pentagon and alphas? <laughs> no, it, you know, it, it's, it's funny walking around with a, a star like that. Um, it, it's like you become invisible because everybody, Everybody is so, you know, like I, I remember people as we were walking through the hallways of the Pentagon, they're, they're, you could almost see what's going through their head is like, that kind of looks like Kevin Bacon. And then and then they get, you know, right abreast to him and, and realize it actually was. And, and some would some would ask for an autograph or stop him or, or some would whisper to their friend or something. And, and I was right. just totally invisible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, you know what? That can be a good thing, I think, yeah, you know. Yeah. Kevin, I remember watching Kevin Bacon on on a BBC show, and he was talking about he put on a, a disguise and he walked through some high vis mall in L.A. And yeah. he goes, normally, if you walked in there, you would get ambushed and just waylaid. And he goes, I walked through and nobody knew who I was. He goes, I kind of miss it. <laughs> I want to take the stuff off so people yeah. would know it was me. Yeah. Uh, well, the movie, uh, you know, the kids asked a lot of questions I, I can remember about the movie and some of the things, what were some of the things that they had combined uh, for brevity or to do the ups and downs? You remember we were talking about that in terms yeah. of like the flight attendant giving you the uh, St. Christopher medal or yeah. giving you the medal. Um, yeah, you're right. They, they, I tell, I, I, I tell people the movie is not a documentary. It's, it's a movie. Um, now it's very closely based on reality and actual events, but, Sometimes, for sake of brevity, they or uh, emotional impact, they they changed a few things. Uh, uh, for example, um, the let me remember. The, so when I was at the at the Dover Mortuary, mm -hmm. there was an Air Force captain. We there were I, I maybe. I don't know, eight, eight to 10 of us escorts arrived generally the, the same day. And so we had some, some of our, our briefs and training together. And one of, the, one of my fellow escorts was an Air Force captain who was escorting his brother home to San Diego. And oh. that, yeah, that really struck me as, as emotional as it was for me escorting a stranger. Uh, yeah, I, I could not imagine escorting your uh, your brother. And then yeah. uh, separate from that, there when when I got to Minneapolis, I was I was on the and I have to say this was kind of a very private trip in the sense that I didn't want to get into conversations with people um, about what I was doing and why I was in uniform and and even the for the most part the the um the flight crew and the, now they knew of course but the I, I just didn't want to talk to anybody i felt like i i it was just it was not my story to tell um and i, yeah. I didn't i didn't even really know the story of how chance was killed and i didn't want to get into you know debates about the war or anything like that so there was I, a hot I, time back then too yeah yeah so with, with that as the as the setting um when i got to minneapolis I was on the tarmac watching the unloading of, of Chance's remains, and the next um, gate over was an, another flight that had a uh, an army sergeant who was also a, a fellow escort escorting remains, and it it was it was very interesting to me 
it, it was profound to, to run into a fellow escort and, and to kind of have that connection and somebody I felt like I could instantly, like we both knew what each other was going through and, and nobody else could possibly know. Right. And, and it, what was, what was interesting is he, we were different services and, uh, I was a Lieutenant Colonel and he was a Sergeant, but at that moment we were just escorts yeah. and, and that was such a bigger mission and it, it really struck me. And so to, a roundabout way to answer your question in the movie, they combined, they made it so that that Sergeant was escorting his brother. And I, I don't begrudge them at all for, for taking that license, the, the, I guess you'd call it literary license, to right. to sort of change what actually happened because it, it told two stories in, in one character for the kind of for the sake of brevity. Um, you know, the, the story of, the, of a, a, an escort escorting his brother and then the story of a, a Marine lieutenant colonel and an army sergeant uh, kind of relying on each other, if, if ever so briefly. Yeah, I could see that too. I mean, that would be, that's, I'm sure it's happened. Yeah. I could see him doing that though. Yeah. Um, the one thing that stuck out in my mind when I watched the movie years ago, uh, I haven't go through the transition of uh, rent a homeless dude to watch a x-ray machine to the creation of TSA and, and the way that they treated us, even as crew going through. When I saw you go through in your alphas and he goes, you know, take your jacket off, take this, do that. And, and his reply was, I will not denigrate this uniform. Uh, take me to a private screening room. You know, yeah. that hit me because those guys at that time were really, really tough and, and not yeah. and overbearing and, and is a good word. Uh, I won't say the other word, but somewhat jerks, I, I would say, but. Um, having been through wearing my uniform and then they, they want me to take everything off. I, I, I totally been there with you. That, yeah. uh, that was crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, Marines are kind of finicky about their uniforms to start with. Uh, and I, uh, on that mission, uh, I did not, I, I kind of, you know, I didn't want to start taking off the jacket, which, which changes the, it, changes the uniform really and and i thought i you know people don't need to to watch uh, a marine uh take apart the uniform in public view and if and i understand that you know whether it was um over the top security you know you know whatever it was their policy but the, but I, I didn't require um that we do that out of view of of the general public well, you can imagine with the metal detector going down your legs and hitting the yeah. shirt stays. <laughs> beep, yeah. beep. What, what's that? Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> shirt stays, man. What are shirt stays? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, you know. Yeah, uh, explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or the part where you're sitting next to the girl and she's texting. She's like, well, I'm sitting next to a hot soldier. And you lean over and you're like, Marine. <laughs> well, let me. I'm glad you brought that up because I like to, I like to point out I, one, I did not write that scene. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of embarrassing. And and two, I, I will flat out say that did not happen. But I, I want to explain uh, some of the, the the reason the director included that in the movie. Uh, sure. And it, it, it is kind of a, almost everybody I think who's seen that scene, they, they, they get a little laugh out of it. Um, and- It is, uh, it's funny. I mean, yeah, as a and, Marine, it's funny, and, but not and, our- and I, yeah, I I asked the director. I said, you know, why did you do that? That didn't happen. And he said, he said, in a movie or a story like that, you have to give the audience a minute to catch their breath. Right. You you kind of need to let them laugh for a second, and, sure, and and catch their breath, and then you go on. And so that was the motivation behind that. Well, um, I've got a, a couple friends that are writing comments as we're speaking, and. Um, Yano said uh, he was tasked. Uh, he was tasked with escorting uh, a squadron mate who was killed in action. Mm-hmm. So much of what he read and saw from you influenced how he did his job. So even to this day, you know you're you're helping our Marines and you're helping others that get put in that position, um, which is not an easy position at all. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. 
Well, after all these years, I mean, how long has it been? Uh, when did it come out in 2000? And well, um, Chance, Chance was killed in 2004, and the movie uh, debuted in 2009. 2009. A lot had changed. I mean, when you think about it, they had uh, the deaths of every soldier Marine in the USA Today the, through the entire time President Bush was in office. And then as soon as he left office, you never heard about it again. It was almost, you know, we joked the uh, forgotten war. Hmm. Um, I mean, when I went over to Afghanistan in 2008, you never heard about it, anything. So I'm thinking that was actually probably a really uh, good time for the movie to come out. It's affected so many people at that time uh, with the losses that we did have. They would understand it, you know, and a friend of mine that worked out in Hollywood told me, well, they're not making movies about the war unless it has aliens. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. And then sure enough, Battlefield LA or whatever <laughs> came yeah. came out with Marines going up against aliens. I'm like, why can't you do something good about, you know, our guys and our mission over overseas? Yeah. So. Well, kind of on, on that point of it, things being forgotten, I, I, w I would point out um, – Defense Secretary Robert Gates, he mentioned in his book, uh, Duty, uh, and this was after the Bush administration when Gates was secretary, that uh, he uh, he saw the movie and he changed the policy. To, and if the family agreed, uh, uh, news media were allowed to cover the dignified transfers at Dover. And also, um, and I don't know if this was directly due to the movie, but um, also at the same time, they, um, the Defense Department uh, created, um, uh, I, I don't know what the right word is, like a uh, allowance to uh, bring in families at government expense if the family wanted to be there for the dignified transfer. So not, not every family did and, and not every family uh, wanted media coverage, but if, if there was some change, and, and I personally, I mean, I, I, I can understand if uh, people have a different view, but I think uh, that was good to bring transparency to the cost that uh, we paid and, and, and the, the visceral cost that, that's visible at Dover when you see a dignified transfer. Yeah, that's an incredible duty that those folks do. Uh, I worked with the, with the guys over as the air boss. When I was in TQ, we had a, a center for the remains. And then, of course, then we would take them out and put them on our angel flights, C-130s mm -hmm. out. And load them, and it would be an empty airplane with, with one body, yeah. or you know how many bodies they yeah. had uh, at the time. It was kind of a 05 was was a bad time. We did um, oh, master sergeant. He was a EOD. Um, had dinner with him, like um, um, Angus, master sergeant Angus, two nights before he died, mm -hmm. and then he got blown up. And uh, they called me up and said, hey. Instead of doing the transfer down at the uh, Air Force area, could we do it at the VIP section? So I called up uh, Chief of Staff and um, uh, General Whistler was the boss. And I called up Chief of Staff and asked, could we use that area? And they said, yes, no problem. So 300 Marines were lined up from MWSS, uh, lined up all the way from the tail of the airplane uh, to the front. So hmm. as his casket was brought out, 300 salutes slowly going up and down and then we we put his body on the c-130 and he was the only uh, transport on that airplane uh, mm, wow. so i gotta say that when you do pass there is a lot of stuff that people don't realize happens and yeah. and that was just on the sandbox side so i could imagine the reception he got when he got back to dover and uh, man god god bless you for what you did because that's uh, a yeah, that's tough thanks. duty, brother. Yeah, thank you. Well, well it, I mean, it 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 was uh, it was kind of weighty, but it was such an honor, and it, it's um, something I'm I'm very proud that I was able to contribute to getting him home. Well, you know what? That's going to last forever. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, your your name and and what you did is on film. It's kind of like it's kind of like uh, R. V. Bergen when he's an older gentleman. He, he was a uh, EB sledges platoon sergeant, you know, oh, who yeah, wrote okay. with the old breed. Yeah. And RV lived down the road here about, I don't know, 45 minutes, hour away. And he goes, Carol, 
when I die, I want you to give my eulogy. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, sure, man. No problem. He'll forget about it. And then sure <laughs> enough, you know, 10 years later, RV dies and his daughter calls me up and says, hey, daddy said you were going to give his eulogy. And I'm going, uh, <laughs> how, do you, how do you give a eulogy to a guy whose entire yeah. Marine Corps career is in a TV show called The Pacific? Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It, it's tough, but at least, you know, like RV's legend will live on and on. And and so will yours. And I, in, in a dignified way, it's, yeah. it's really an honor. Yeah. Thanks. I, How was, about your family? Was, Did they uh, get to go? Do you guys get to go out to Hollywood for the premiere? And yeah, I, I'll tell you, HBO was so generous. Um, they, they took us, uh, we went to, I, I won't even remember everywhere, uh, DC, New York. Um, uh, well, we, they had a, they had a premiere in Dubois, Wyoming. Um, uh, which, really? Which might have been the most fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope you understand what I mean by fun. Uh, the most rewarding, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because all the family um, and friends were there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I think we had one in Los Angeles. But um, they also, they they flew, uh, my, uh, let's see, my, my whole family, we went to the Emmy Awards. Um, and then, uh, un unfortunately, not everybody could go, but they also flew me to the Golden Globe Awards, which was just fantastic. And um, uh, various other things in between. H HBO also, when I retired from the Marine Corps, uh, they surprised me and, and flew John Phelps from Wyoming out here to Quantico so he could be at my retirement. They were just so generous. Um, oh, with, that is with, awesome. Yeah, it, it was great. Do, uh, do you have any other, I mean, you, you won an award for help writing that, right? Yeah, Ross and I, uh, we won the Writers Guild Award. Uh, so yeah. that, that was quite an honor. Uh, we were nominated for an Emmy for Best um, Screenplay. And then uh, I wow. <laughs> I should remember this. I, I don't remember if we were nominated for a Golden Globe or not. The, the movie was. And, and Kevin Bacon won the Golden Globe for his role. Um, but yeah, we and, and there were some other um, a few other awards we won, but the Writers Guild was the big one. Right. Well, with all that, do you, do you have do you have a little thing in your I love me wall somewhere? <laughs> we uh, there uh, there. I know it's uh, uh, I don't know what the right term is, uh, but uh, they're they're on the fireplace mantle. Were you surprised to see that um, that Mew deal that you had? Um, that I sent you the picture from Parker Perkins. It's up oh, in the Marine Memorial yeah, Hotel I, down I, in San Francisco. Actually, I, I had seen that. Um, I'd been in that. I'd been at the Marine Memorial uh, Hotel and, and seen it soon after that went up. Um, I was actually TBS roommates with uh, uh, now retired Colonel Chris Starling, who uh, oh, wow. basically he ran the Marine Memorial uh, Hotel for quite a while. And and he's his name's on that plaque as well. And, oh, that's uh, funny. Yeah, so he Proudfoot, found. I don't I know where Proudfoot, he, Proudfoot was one of our instructors uh, yeah. at TBS. He was our tactics guy yeah. in '88. Yeah. So he must have left TBS with you. Went through in '89. No, I went through '88 also. Um, hotel, uh, Hotel '88. When did you go through? Yeah, I was um, Echo '88. Okay, so he was our tactics instructor. Yeah, yeah. Same uh, for me. Joe Harrison, do you remember him? I knew Joe, if we're talking about the same guy, uh, we worked together at Manpower and Reserve Affairs and then yes. we went over to PCOM. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Joe, Joe Harrison's a buddy of mine. We went over to Iraq together. And when okay. I look at him, I'm like, I know you. I know you. Where do I know you from? Oh, my God. You're my instructor back in TBS in, in 88. You know, hey, sir. Good to see you. Oh, I love well, that I guy. OK, I didn't realize he was a TBS instructor also. Yeah, he was a he was a TBS instructor there, and he did tactics. Proudfoot did tactics. Yeah, uh, there was a whole whole bunch of guys out there. Um, Mark Lister, um, let's see, Mark Lister's on here. He's I'm, I'm looking at some of the guys that are writing comments here, but mm -hmm. uh, I can guarantee you that there are a ton of Marines that are watching this or are going to watch it when they get home from work. All right. Uh, so if you want to shout out to any of uh, your Marine buddies, <laughs> now's the time. Go ahead and well, throw their names uh, out there. I, well, I, I work at Manpower and Reserve Affairs now. So, I, you know, I, I see Marines all day, every day. And uh, I, <laughs> I can spend all <laughs> afternoon or all evening uh, giving shout outs. 
So well, do they? Do they? Do most of the guys that you work with do they do they even know the background? Probably it's been a couple of years. Uh, not really. I don't think so. Um, I I I have a. I have a nice plaque in my office uh, from being nominated for an Emmy. And uh -huh. uh, I, I had a lieutenant colonel in there uh, in my office the other day. And and this has been hanging on my wall for, I don't know, three years or so. And he's he's been with us uh, maybe two years. And, right. and he it, it seemed like he noticed it for the first time and, and was not aware <laughs> of the story. So uh, Did you start calling him Moto after <laughs> the obvious. <laughs> Um, no, I, you know, they're, they're too busy, uh, manning the Marine Corps to pay attention to what's on my wall. Well, what's cool. What's going on? Speaking of manpower, how is everything? Oh. Up there? <laughs> uh, I don't know, even know where to begin. We're, uh, we're, we're, um, very actively implementing the commandant's force, uh, force design for, uh, the Marine Corps of 2030, uh, kind of re reposturing to, uh, uh, enable the Marine Corps to fight the in the the Indo-PACOM region. That's that's taking a lot of our our focus and effort right now. What are we going down to? What do, or what are we what are we right now? How how when I got out, I think it was two hundred and ten thousand. Yeah, uh, hundred and eighty thousand nine hundred and fifty-eight today. Wow. So about one hundred eighty-one thousand, roughly. And what are we going down to? I think we were 175 when I joined. Yeah, we we were 170, 172, 600 on 9/11, and then rapidly grew from there um, in in starts and fits. But uh, we we haven't been we haven't been below 180 for quite a while, um, and yeah. it, it's kind of still TBD on on where we'll end up. Um, so I, I hesitate to throw out a number in this in this forum right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Well, do you get a chance to go down to um, um, Globe and Laurel? Do you ever get oh, to go down there and, yeah, and see them? The, the, the last time I was there was a farewell lunch for Lieutenant General Berlakis when he, he uh, left from being the deputy McRick. commandant. for he Well, he was C.G. Mickrick for a while. And then uh, he was deputy commandant for manpower, and uh, we were we had his farewell lunch in there. Yeah, yeah, he was he was my CG when I I think I oh, left. Yeah. I retired in two thousand fifteen. He was in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Who who's the CG in there uh, right now? Uh, Mick Rick. It's, yeah. Uh, Major Major General Jason Bohm. Oh, I don't know him. Yeah, that just means we're getting old, and all the young guys are uh, <laughs> all the young yeah. guys are, are are shooting up there, aren't they? <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, they are. Well, Mike, I I can't thank you enough. And hey, do you? Uh, somebody asked, do you have a brother named Mark? I do. So uh, a couple guys went to TBS with Mark. Yeah. Okay. Did he yeah, go at the same was, time as you? Like, or uh, well, I was I was on staff at TBS then. That would have been about 93, uh, give or take. Oh, so your younger brother came in and you were on staff at TBS? Yeah, yeah I was teaching the fire support package when he went through. So I, I didn't yeah. haze him, but my, my peers, the other captains in the instructional group, they, they were all over in every, every class, which I was fine with. <laughs> <laughs> I give him a hard time. I love it, yeah, man. Yeah. Nothing like having a brother. Uh, <laughs> and you got to go fly American out to Colorado the other day, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. About, uh, three weeks or so ago. Yep. They yeah, treated how was me well. American A team for all my well, Southwest buddies. We're the A team. Well, yeah, it was it was great. Um, I was surprised how crowded my outbound flights were, but coming back, I had uh, I had like a uh, two rows and and. Uh, all the seats around me open. So that was nice. Wow. Yeah. It makes it nice. Yeah. But well, we need more people. So everybody watching this, go <laughs> ahead and book your summer vacations, get going. We need money. American needs money. Southwest Delta United. We all need the business. So uh, putting a plug in for my company, everybody go out there and start flying, go see your, your parents. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. One, one of our big challenges right now in the manpower world is, uh, is jet pilots. And so we're trying to poach them from American and United and 
or, or keep them from going there. Oh, uh, I should say. Well, right. I mean, you know, this is temporary. After 9-11, we had this yeah. big giant shutdown. And then and then we took at American, we took pay cuts and then we had. Um, so we had the pay cut contract and then we had age 65 where pilots normally retired at 60. They went to 65. So that strung it out even more. And then we went into bankruptcy in 2000 and I want to say 2011. I know it was my birthday. It was November 30th. And then um, then we merged with U.S. Air and then everybody started, you know, merging together. Um, and it just took forever. So at the 16 year mark, I was able to go uh, left and be a captain or go right and go wide body international, which I ended up going triple seven and then seven, eight, seven. Uh, whereas the guy, one number junior to me, Dave Manning went to um, uh, captain in Miami, but he had to commute for a year and a half to Miami to a crash pad, then LA for a year and a half. Then he got back. And now, you know, we saw this stuff happening in the last five or six years where guys were coming over and all of a sudden they're making captain in three and a half years. I mean, that's mind blowing to me. I mean, it's great for them. Uh, a little bit jealous on my part because we're yeah. kind of that lost generation. But, yeah, I, I see this, though, kind of doing its cycle. Uh, who knows where and what will happen with the airlines. And, you know, there will probably be some more pain. But as soon as the vaccine or November 3rd, whichever comes first, um, something happens, then people are going to forget about it and they're going to move on to the next big thing. And COVID will be a distance Distant memory, I pray that yeah, we don't have so. to wear masks. You guys have to wear masks up there, at manpower. Yeah, we, when when we're anywhere away from our own desk, yeah. Uh, so at least in your office, you're able to to take the mask off. Yeah, I'm I'm lucky to have a, a nice office. I can take the mask off because it's a long day when you if you wear a mask. Uh, yeah, for hours on end. Yeah. Well, I've got a a, a very famous F eighteen guy named uh, Dwight Smith. They call him Chugger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Chugger's asking if uh, there's any room for old colonels to come back in. You take any of the old guys, especially ones that fought Godzilla and fought uh, aliens in yeah. that Will Smith movie. Is he commenting right now? He is. Well, okay. I, I don't know if he's told you the story, but he and I uh, were childhood friends. Uh, went to, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, Dwight, how are you doing? Hey, uh, we, hey, Dwight, we if uh, you're watching it, yeah, he's on there. He just commented just a minute ago. Um, we we yeah, went to uh, we, we went to more basketball games. <laughs> no one, no one, Dwight, no one, Dwight, he probably sold you a, a refrigerator, you know, brand new refrigerator to an Eskimo. You know, that's the type of guy he is. <laughs> yeah, I got a story about he can, he can yeah. talk. That's for sure. Man, I had I had, we I lived with Dwight in um, in Pensacola. I moved in with him and another lieutenant. And I just come back from the gun show, and I had this nine millimeter. And the and the other guy, I'm not going to say his name, goes, uh, "Let me see that thing." So I strip it. Here you go. Hand it to him. He takes a round and he sticks it in the in there and he closes it. He walks out and he goes, "Boom!" And he shoots it off out of my apartment. Of course, the reverb is. Super loud. Cops come. Dwight goes out there to the police officer and goes, um, hey, officer, there were some kids with M80s and they ran through the woods o over there. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I mean, Dwight, Dwight's very smooth. He's telling yeah. me to be quiet. Yeah. Yes. All right. Sorry, <laughs> Dwight. Uh, oh, man. Do you, do you have any other, uh, do you know any C-130 guys went through Echo with you? Oh. Uh, um, I don't remember. No, I, I, I can't remember it, at least not from my platoon. Yeah. 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 You were there. Yeah. Um, so we were at TBS together then. In yeah. 88. Yeah. Damn. Good times, brother. <laughs> well, once again, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for your service and for what you did for, uh, PFC chance, uh, Phelps. Well, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. It's good to talk to you and Semper Fi to all the Marines out there. Yeah, they're they're all going to be watching this. They're going to be putting comments up. I know you're not on Facebook, so you have to get a bogus account somewhere and, and <laughs> you know, may, may, maybe Kevin Bacon, too, or something. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> you ever now? Do you ever keep up with him? I'd love to get him on the show to um, talk about being a Marine. Where did he learn how to salute? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Um, like I said, he he took the role very seriously, but there were also. Uh, uh, in, in addition to my uh, sporadic attendance on the movie set, there was a full-time uh, gunnery sergeant and a master oh, Vic. sergeant. Yeah, uh, Vic was the master sergeant. And, and, oh, uh, yeah. Um, it, the the gunny's name escapes me at the moment, but uh, so they, you know, they had good staff and CO leadership there on set the whole time. Oh, good. Make sure his uniform looked good and the whole yeah. nine yards. Yeah, yeah I, I went out to Vegas with uh, Vic on a salute to troops, salute oh, yeah. to the troops, and and that's how we met. And and it happened to be that year I was the the poster boy in the American Way magazine. So when you opened up the American Way, there was Mitch Bell, and it was a little article about me and all that. So people were, "Hey man, would you autograph my and my thing?" And then the big thing on Facebook was everybody would take a picture of this stupid thing, and uh, you know, hey, I'm flying with Mitch. And they post it, you know. So That's great. I got a lot of a lot of razzing for that. That was kind of fun, though. Well, if you're ever back down here in Texas, uh, let me know so that we can take you out and go ride in the armor and uh, scare some of the, the Californians that have moved into Texas. Let them know that <laughs> open carry is alive and well, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, listen. Tell your wife thanks for uh, letting us pull you away from uh, the yard work, and I certainly do appreciate, you, brother. Um, the COVID shut down SLCDA this year, but if yeah. they uh, they bring it back up next year, or, or would you be able to do it or yeah, come if, back if, if it fits with the calendar, yeah, I enjoy going out there and doing that. Good. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate all the help you did when we first kicked that program off. Yeah. A lot yeah, of kids were, you know, when I looked, I meant to tell you, when I looked through the critiques, a lot of the kids, not only through the interaction with the staff, but your final deal was right before the graduation, right? And there were kids going, I was thinking about going into the Navy or I was thinking about going to West Point. I got an offer to go to the Air Force Academy. And they were writing, I want to be a Marine because mm -hmm. of Lieutenant Colonel Strobel and the men like him. So your your impact uh, via through uh, film, uh, real life events, but through the film and then meeting them in person, taking the time to meet them in person and answer their questions. Those kids were just floored. And uh, there, are, there are kids that are on Facebook right now uh, who are now lieutenants um, out in the fleet, you know, and they're at yeah. TBS. Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a neat deal. You know, us old guys retire and, yeah. and we're getting that young blood coming in, but we're getting the right guys and gals, yeah. you know, we're getting strong moral convictions. Mm -hmm. So I really loved it. I mean, that was one of the parts of the whole SLCDA Summer Leadership Character Development Academy was it has to be ethics, character development or leadership. And what what, you know, driving an LAV around, what part of those three tenets does that achieve? You know, and, and your thing fit perfect with community service and leadership. So, you know, doing the community service stuff um, out at the Quantico Cemetery, followed mm -hmm. by watching your film of you volunteering your time to take care of one of our fellow Marines. Yeah. Really hit home, man. Yeah. Great. Well, well, I'll Hey, I it. love you brother. And uh, right. I will catch up with you soon. I'm going to, I'll drop you out. You can stay on if you want, but I've taken uh, so much of your time, but I really appreciate it, Mike. Okay. You bet. This was fun. You have a good one. Simplify brother. You too. Thanks. Hoorah. Bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, great night. I hope you enjoyed watching our show with Mike. Um, as I as I said before, one incredible guy who's just as uh, down to earth, uh, super super nice. The Marine that you, the epitome of the Marine that you want to be. That officer is the guy that I want to be like. You know. So I hope you all have a wonderful Tuesday. I had my tacos today with two margaritas. It was a wonderful lunch. Uh, you guys need to do it too. And uh, Kelly, I forgot what your question was. Let me look. Uh, thanks, Dwight. Let me look up. What did Kelly ask? Kelly asked something and I totally forgot what it was. It was Kelly, 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 Kelly. Where are you, Kelly? You did. You asked something good and I can't remember what it was. Uh, 
did Kevin? Oh, yeah. Hey, that was answered, Kelly. So uh, we have a, a guy named Vic. Well, I'll get Vic on. As a matter of fact, he's uh, he's retired now. He was the uh, technician on set for the film. I totally forgot about that. And Teresa and I sat with him and uh, and his girlfriend when we went out to Vegas for a salute to the troops. So I could imagine that a gunny or master sergeant probably did a really awesome job uh, keeping him in line. Um, Jeff, Nick, thank you very much. John, Paula, Dwight, Charlie, great seeing you guys on here. Let's see if there, if I missed any other questions. Um, Stephanie, yes, I am going to do a special on you. Your story is going to come on here, and I hope uh, we can get you on here soon. And I've got my purple fox coin back here behind me. It's actually... Uh, it's back here. I have to pull it out for you for the show. Uh, Mark Lister, great. Thank you for coming on. Crystal Moore, you guys are awesome. Dwight, great seeing you on here, brother. You all have an awesome night, and we'll see you uh, next week. Um, I have uh, Leroy Petri, who is Medal of Honor recipient, and he's going to come on and talk to us about uh, his time since uh, the 9-11, uh, since everything and, and the war in Afghanistan and when he received the medal. So look forward to having you guys next Tuesday, the 28th. And I believe it's going to be in the afternoon or maybe no, I think it's going to be at 10 in the morning. I'll have to check my calendar with Leroy, but uh, we'll have him on. And I hope you guys can join us then. Scott Casey, good seeing you, brother. I would love to have you on so that we can talk about uh, everything going on with uh, recruiting in the old days. And Mark Lister, am I going to the tap in on the 10th? You know what? My schedule hasn't come out for November uh, yet as a check airman. It usually comes out like the 27th or 28th of the month. Um, but if it is with the COVID going on, I'm sure there's no balls anywhere. This year I will come. Promise. All right, brother. You guys have a good one. Everyone take care and I will see you guys next Tuesday. Until that time. Simplify. Remember, wherever you go, there you are, and we're going to have a good time. Stay, uh, stay alive, folks, and go out and vote. Vote often. Vote early. Vote numerous times. No, I'm just teasing. That's not allowed. Just vote once, but vote in person. It wasn't a big deal. Wear a mask. You wear a mask, go to Home Depot or Kroger. So go ahead and vote, and uh, we'll see you guys after the election. Hoorah. Take care now.